Probably the most common phrase that's used around Christmas, at least by Christians, is Jesus is the reason for the season. We say that a lot of times, Jesus is the reason for the season. In some ways, we use it as a, as a way to remind ourselves that the central reason that we celebrate Christmas is the birth of Jesus. But it, honestly, in some ways, we use it to tell an outside, unbelieving world that they're wrong. And to be honest with you, I don't always love that approach. It's, it's kind of a, a negative way to approach, to tell people that they don't believe that they've got it all wrong. I think that when we do that, all we do is draw a line in the sand. We draw a line in the sand and accentuate the fact that you're on one side and I'm on the other, and I'm not sure that's the very best way to care for people. Around Journey Church, we make a big deal about when Jesus teaches about the good shepherd who cares for the 99, but leaves the 99 to go chase the one because the one has wandered away and the one needs him. And so it, it, we make a big deal about that. In fact, around Journey Church, we've done a lot of studying, a lot of thinking, a lot of working and praying, honestly, about what the one looks like to us, what it looks like in our world. And to be honest with you, there's a lot of folks, even in this room right now, in, in joining us online who are here kind of investigating, thinking about considering the idea of Jesus, God, faith, church, right? Like all that stuff. And maybe you've been here and you've maybe your whole life been pushed away by the church and there have been drawn lines and saying, you're on one side, I'm on the other. And maybe one of the reasons, not all of the reasons, but maybe one of the reasons is that you know that Christians think that Jesus is the reason for the season but maybe one of the reasons that you've kept faith, God, church, Jesus at arm's length is because you don't think there's a whole lot of reason in the season. And I get that. I get that because at church world, in church circles around Christianity, we talk a lot about faith and feeling. We talk about connection and the things that are really valuable and affirming to us. But man, it can be a little bit difficult. Can I, so can I just speak to you today, especially if you're here, Man, and maybe you or somebody you know has got this whole thing at arm's length because they're not sure that following God, believing in Jesus is a rational, reasonable, scientific, right? Those kinds of things. You, know, you maybe don't have the rational reasons to believe in. For that reason, you've kind of got it a little bit arm's length. You've got questions. You're interested. But maybe you're here today and asking those questions a little bit. Can I tell you what we're not going to do? We're not going to use circular reasoning. Too. We're not going to use the Bible to prove the Bible. What do you mean by that? Like, like logic people, right, call that circular reasoning when we use something to prove something. Like if you were to say to me, what do you believe? And I said, I believe that the Bible is the word of, the God, word of God. And you said, well, why do you believe that the Bible is the word of God? And I said, well, because the Bible says that the Bible is the word of God. That's circular reasoning, using the Bible to prove the Bible. And while that might be proof and evidence to me, because I already believe that the Bible is the word of God, to believe that and state that the reason I believe it is because it says so is circular reasoning. It's unreasonable. Now, I might be able to say to you that I have, I have seen and experienced in my life that I believe that the word of God is because I've personally experienced a connection with the creator of the universe. Now I'm not making uh, an argument from circular reasoning. Now I'm making an argument from, from, uh, from personal experience. Now you might argue with my personal experience, but I'm no longer using circular reasoning. 
right? You might also say that I, I might say, hey, I'm, I'm, uh, I believe that the Bible is the word of God. And the reason I believe that is because it was written by 40 different authors over a period of 4,000 years. And despite the fact that none of those, many of those authors didn't know or have any connection with the other authors, and that even though they're separated and independent, there are differences and unique flavors, but there are no conflicts. And to me, that is an argument from empirical truth. Now, are you confused yet? <laughs> I know you are, because I know sometimes this idea is really a difficult thing. But using circular reasoning, using the Bible to say that the Bible is true, that is a flawed logic. It's not true. It's not accurate. It may be true to me, but it's not absolutely true. Another thing that we're not going to do is we're not today going to answer every imaginable objection. That's called being an, it's an anticipa anticipatory rebuttal. I can't possibly imagine everything that you've questioned. And can I be honest with you? I'm under no delusion in my mind that has me thinking that I, that I know what you think or I know what you feel. So I can't possibly anticipate every rebuttal that you'd have. And I'm not un under any delusion that I could do so. But maybe today my hope is, well, how about this? How about I just tell you what we are going to do? What we are going to do is provide evidence that demands a verdict. It's that simple. I'm not saying that I'm going to prove beyond the shadow of any doubt that something is true or not true. I'm just going to provide enough evidence where you've got to, where you have to decide, what am I going to do with that? You today have to decide what are you going to do with the evidence that we put together in front of you. You just got to weigh it yourself. And really at the end of the day, probably ought to say that we're really providing an evidence that demands a verdict from you. You're the judge and jury. You get to decide for you. It's one of the most powerful and profound things that God does. Is he gives us, you and me, the dignity of being able to choose for ourselves. So I told you what we're not going to do is we're not going to use the Bible to prove the Bible. But that doesn't mean that we're not going to utilize the Bible to see what it is we're trying to prove or disprove. Okay, we're going to look at we've been walking through the first uh, the first 18 verses of the Gospel of John. It's John's perspective on the life and ministry of Jesus. And he writes this out. He starts it out. We said the first week that he said, and the, the, before the word in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. And we talked about how the reason in this season is that Jesus isn't just a man, a teacher, an influencer. He's not just a leader. He wasn't just a great man. That Jesus was God in a bod. And my kids make fun of me for it, right? We talked about that the first week. Now, if you haven't gone back and listened to these, we've been building to this point. We're we're working our way towards something. The reason in this season is that Jesus is God with skin on. And then last week, Chris kind of landed us into a really deep discussion, in all honesty, about something that we in Orthodox Christianity call the Trinity. It's not that we believe in three separate gods. We believe in one God who shows himself in three persons, that he invites us, and this is the best part. He invites us, you and me, out of an excluded relationship, into a relationship, the most perfect relationship that there is, the inner circle, to be connected perfectly with God. Then in the next verses, John kind of unpacks this, and this is where he says it, okay? He says, God sent a man, John the Baptist. Now, pause for one second. This is in the book of John, written by the apostle John, but he's talking about a different John. Two guys, same name, right? God sent a man, John the Baptist to tell us about the light. Now remember up to this point, he says in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. The word was with God in the beginning and that, that everything that was created was created through him. And then Chris unpacked those pieces about, about the Trinity beneath that. And then he says this, God sent a man, he said, sent John the Baptist to tell us about the light. Up to this point, he's been referring to Jesus as the Word. Now he begins to re refer to him in the light. And if you talk through, if you work through the rest of the Gospel of John, you'll see that light is, is John's favorite go-to way of referring to Jesus. He sees about darkness and light. He says that John, he sent John the Baptist to tell us about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. Because... He says, this is what's going on. Remember when I said what we were going to do and what we weren't going to do? We weren't going to use circular reasoning. I wasn't going to anticipate all your rebuttals. 
This is exactly why John came. John came so that everyone might believe because of his testimony, because of his personal experience. The argument he was making was from his own personal experience and from his own perspective. It says John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell us about the light. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, who's coming, was coming into the world, that Jesus was stepping onto the scene. Now, you're probably going, okay, where's the rational argument? This is just information. Can I say this? Let me just, just point this out to you. When you're in the dark, what is the most significant thing you need? The light, right? I don't know about how this works in your home, but in my home, my wife will rearrange the furniture from time to time. Now, we rearrange the furniture in broad daylight, totally okay. We re re rearrange the furniture and it's in the darkness and all, the only way I have to find something is my little toe, apparently, right? And I don't know about you, but that's not so great. The, my biggest need in the darkness is light. I'm just glad she can't rearrange where the toilet is, if you know what I'm saying, right? So the most important thing about this is that we get something most important about this. It's this, that God planned for Jesus. That God had a plan. He said, listen, I, I, I'm not just going to see a problem and meet a need, right? That, that's what we do. We see a need, meet a need. You drive up to the up to a stoplight and you see a person who might need some cash and you decide in the moment, do I want to answer that need or is that not a need that I'm supposed to answer? That's see a need and meet a need. That's not what God did. God anticipated a need. He knew that it was coming and he was bringing a need and he prepared and planned and laid it out. The last person that he sends to make the way for Jesus is this person, John the Baptist. And he's kind of like the guy who goes in front and goes, Prepare the way, make a hole, move, right? He says, spread out, Jesus is coming. He's the very, very last piece. Now listen, it's a big deal that he just sent one, right? Just that he sent Jesus, John the Baptist, to prepare the way for Jesus. That means that God had a plan. But God planned way before this moment. God planned so significantly before this moment that he'd been doing this since the very, very beginning. All the way back. Not one moment wasn't pointing toward the coming of God. The moment when God, the Word, was with him in the beginning and the Word was God and was with God. And then later we'll look at next week how it says the Word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. Because here's the deal, and this is the way Paul writes it in Galatians. He says this, but when the right time came, God sent his Son. The way this phrase works, when the right time came. It, it, it literally translated from Greek into English would read, but when every single detail was perfectly in place. When God had orchestrated all of time and all of the characters and all the stories, and when the exact right time had moved in, God said, I'm going to send my son. You see, Christmas isn't a, isn't a cute story. It's a substantial story. This may not seem like a big deal to you unless you realize, unless you come to understand how significantly we needed the light to come into the darkness of our life. Now listen, now you're going, okay, I understand that I'm, and I'm dark. You know, I live in the darkness, right? I understand that I'm a sinner. You know what? In 30 years of ministry, I barely had to convince anybody that, that they're a sinner. When I talk to people about, hey, do you live in a world that's hopeless? They're like, yep, live in a world that's hopeless. Do you feel like you've ever done anything wrong? Everybody's like, yeah, everybody has, right? We all get that. We know that we need dark. We know that it, we're in darkness and we need a light. The question is, and this is the, where the rational argument comes in, if God prepared a way for us to see light in the darkness, and the bigger question is, is there a real rational reason to believe that Jesus really is the Messiah? Is there a real, rational, intelligent, logical, scientific, mathematical, is there a left-brained, rational reason to believe that Jesus is who he says he is? And I want to tell you today, and we're going to walk through a chunk of it at least, that that is absolutely the case. That throughout the Bible, there are 300 and 33 prophecies that foretell the coming of Jesus onto the scene, the coming of the Messiah onto the scene. 333. 
there are 70 major, prophet, ma major prophecies. That means throughout the Old Testament that there are 70 places where, where something substantial or significant is told about the coming Messiah that would one day show up. 70 of them. And then there are 273 what we'll call like supporting prophecies. It's kind of like if it said, here's the main prophecy, and then another prophecy comes along. It's a prophecy in and of itself, but in ways it just kind of adds detail to the major prophecy. 70 majors, 273 uh, supporting prophecies. Total 333 indications of Jesus, of the Messiah, coming one day down the road. Now listen, if I could predict the future 10 minutes in advance, it's a big deal, right? If I could tell you what's going to happen, sometimes you'd say, oh, you see the circumstances lining up. But that's not what's going on here. That, that's not at all what's going on. The last, the, the, the most recent of the prophecies, right? If there's 333 of them all coming about the coming Messiah, the last prophecy is 500 years before Jesus comes into the scene. It's not a couple of weeks, a couple of months. It's not John the Baptist, you know, like baptizing him or any of those things. It's not the things that happen when he shows up. The last of those is 500 years before then. Now you might be going, Jeremy, come on, give me a break. I mean, they probably waited until after Jesus was born and then rewrote the prophecies so it looked like Jesus fulfilled them. Can't be. Can I tell you why? This is really interesting because the Bible, the Old Testament, wasn't written in English. I know that's not a surprise to you, right? It wasn't even written in Greek. It was written in Hebrew. When it was written in Hebrew, it was translated into Greek. We call that document the Septuagint. Don't let the big word scare you. The Septuagint is the translation of the, of the Hebrew text into Greek. And here's the deal. That translation, of which we have the original documents, was done 250 years before Jesus. And it includes every one of all 333 prophecies of the coming Messiah, all written in the translation between Hebrew and Greek, 250 years. So I, that's logical thing. Hey, this is just evidence we're putting over here, right? Evidence that demands a verdict from you. And then we look at the possibility. What happens? Like there are 333 prophecies, every single one of them fulfilled in Jesus. Maybe you're going, well, that seems like it could be an accident, couldn't it? I mean, it's just, it's a possibility, right? That he just happened to do those things. I think you'll see that that's maybe not the most logical possibility. Do you know this? That one in 10 men are bald. I mean, I, I think it's uniquely handsome, but you know, like, but one in 10 men are bald. That means if you went out of here and you met 10 new men, there's a, a one in 10 likelihood that one of them is going to be bald. You realize that one in a thousand men are missing a finger. I mean, one in a hundred men are missing a finger. Now, what is the possibility or the probability that of you walking out the door and meeting one in 10 men that are bald, right? You have one in 10 chance, and meeting a guy that has missing a finger, you get one in a hundred chance. But what is the possibility of you meeting one man who has a bald head and missing one finger? We find that mathematical probability by multiplying those two numbers, 10 times 100. So you have a 1 in 1,000 chance of walking out the door and meeting a bald man who's missing one of his fingers. That's a 1 in 1,000 chance. That's a pretty small chance, right? Now listen, these are, that's how we determine probability. What's the probability of Jesus accidentally fulfilling the 333 prophecies of, of the coming Messiah and not actually being the Messiah. What's the probability of that? I don't know, <laughs> to be honest with you. I, I, know, I know very little. I'm not that smart of a guy, but here's what I do know. I know how to stay in my lane. But here's what we can do. We can look at the first eight prophecies. What if we just said there were not 233, but instead there were only eight? What if the 225, what is the probability that Jesus would come to earth and fulfill just accidentally eight of those prophecies? Not 333, just eight, right? What's the possibility of that? You can extrapolate it along all that other stuff if you want to do the math later, but this is absolutely statistically provable and true. Peter Stoner wrote it almost 30 years ago, hasn't been argued with since. 
And it starts by just saying, hey, God went all the way back to the beginning to say who, who the Messiah was going to be. His son was going to come into the picture. It says this in Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity or distance between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. And he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Now, not, we don't have time to go into this in, in unbelievable depth, but let's just say it this way. This part of it where it says there'll be distance or, or uh, between enmity between your offspring and hers, it's really just saying there's going to be a difference between your offspring and hers. Because every single person, every single person that's referred to throughout Scripture as coming into the world is, is said that it would become from the seed of the man. But one person in all of scripture who is said to be coming would be God says, hey, this woman, this, this man who is going to come, this Messiah who's going to step into the picture is going to come from the seed of the woman. The seed of the woman is the very first prophecy. Now, what, why, where's the seed of the woman come in? Jesus was born of a virgin, right? Jesus was born of the seed of the woman, not of the seed of the man. Every other person born of the seed of the man, but he was born as the seed of the woman. So the prophecies fulfilled by Jesus, the very first one is that Jesus is the seed of the man. It comes from the seed of the woman. Get what God does. God takes the totality of all of the population of the world and says, there'll be one who comes and he's the seed of the woman. Now you might go, okay, well, wait a minute. That's, that's a little stretch or that's at least interesting. What God does beyond that is just narrow and narrow and narrow and narrow over a period of thousands of years leading up to 250, at least 250, 500 really, but at least 250 years before Jesus comes into the picture. The first, the second one is that he's going to come from the lineage of Shem. Do you know that Noah has three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth? And Noah has three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Every single human being on, in the earth's population can trace their lineage back to one of these three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. And the, Jesus, or God says that his son is going to come through the lineage of Shem. Not just the seed of the woman, but the lineage of Shem. Now we're starting to narrow it down because God's taken a thir three sons and said, hey, it's not going to come from this one. It's not going to come from this one. It's going to come from this one. Seed of the woman, lineage of Shem. And then God goes a little bit further and he says he's going to not only come from the seed of the woman, lineage of Shem, but from the, de from the descendants of Abraham. Abraham. Now, that sounds like a big deal. God says this promise to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. He says, you're going to be the father of many nations. That not only is the Messiah, not only is my son going to come from the, from the seed of the woman and lineage of Shem, but he's going to come as a descendant of Abraham. Now, Abraham was a busy man. Abraham had eight children. Abraham had eight children, uh, two of them from his wife, Sarah. And the two from his wife, Sarah, God said, my line of, is not only going to come from the seed of the woman, lineage of Shem, and, but, and the descendants of Abraham, but he's going to come from the line of Isaac, Abraham's son, Isaac. Takes the world and says, hey, listen, there are three sons of Noah. And all, the, the Messiah is going to come through one third of those, narrows it down. He says that he's not only going to come from the line, lineage of Shem, he's going to come from the descendants of Abraham. And not just any of the descendants of Abraham, he's going to knock out seven eighths of those and say that he's going to come through the line of Isaac. And then Isaac has, has two sons. He has two sons, Jacob and Esau, and he says that he's going to take the, the descendants of Isaac, the sons of Isaac, and he's going to come not through, through Esau, but through Jacob's line. You see what God's doing? Not just the seed of the woman and the lineage of Shem and not just the, the descendants of Abraham and not just the, the line of Isaac, and the, but the line specifically of Jacob. Now, now listen, you're familiar with Jacob and Esau. You may not even realize it. But do you know that, that the conflict in the Middle East today is all traced back to this? The Arabs come from the line of Esau. The Israelis come from the line of Jacob. The line of Jacob is where God said, hey, my son is going to come through the line of Jacob. And the, the Israeli people are the center of that, of that question. And those Israelis are divided up into 12 tribes. So God says, hey, of the line of Jacob, the 12 tribes of Israel, here's the deal. My son is not going to come from all these other tribes. He's going to take 11 twelfths of those and move them off to the side. That my son is going to come from not just from the seed of the woman, lineage of Shem, and descendants of Abraham, and the line of Isaac, and the line of Jacob, but also he's going to come from the tribe of Judah. Eleven twelfths of the population of Israel moved aside. He's going to come specifically from the tribe of Judah. 
Now we're just moving our way through the family line, right? God's been orchestrating and planning this. It wasn't just John the Baptist showing up into the picture. That God himself said, hey, my son is going to come in and I want to make a huge way for him. He's going to come from the seed of the woman and the lineage of Shem and the, and the descendants of Abraham and the line of Isaac and the line of Jacob and the tribe of Judah. But he's going to narrow that down. It's not just a man. There's a lot of people in the tribe of Judah. There is a lot of people. In fact, I'm going to take all of the tribe of Judah and I'm going to wipe out all of them except one family. Hundreds of families in the tribe of, of Judah. But God says he's not just going to come from the seed of the woman and the, the, linea the lineage of Shem and the descendants of Abraham and the line of Isaac and the line of Jacob and the tribe of Judah. He's going to come from the family of Jesse. Now, Jesse had some sons, 12 to be exact, right? Jesse had 12 sons and one of his sons, you remember his story. He was a young man, became the king of, he became the king of Israel. He became the king of the Hebrew people. He's the same little boy that wandered onto the field of a giant named Goliath. You see, God said, hey, not only is my son going to come from the seed of the woman and the lineage of Shem and the descendants of Abraham, the line of Isaac and the line of Jacob and the tribe of Judah, he's going to come from the family of Jesse. And of the 12 kids that Jesse has, 11 of them are not going to happen. Here's the deal. It's going to come from the house of David. It's going to come from the seed of the woman and the lineage of Shem and the descendants of Abraham and the line of Isaac and the line of Jacob and the tribe of Judah and the family of Jesse and the house of David. He was very, very specific. And here's the deal. This is where we get to it. It's crazy. Fast forward a thousand years. A thousand years and the psalmist writes, uh, writes the, this kind of obscure, weird prophecy in Psalm chapter 22. And he says that this son who comes from the seed of the woman and lineage of Shem and the descendants of Abraham and the line of Jacob and the line, the line of Isaac and the line of Jacob and the tribe of Judah and the family of Jesse and the house of David is going to be crucified. He's going to be stretched out and his arms and his feet are going to be nailed to a tree and he's going to die a death that's meant for a murderer or a sinner. Now you're probably going, well, Jeremy, lots of people. Lots of people died of crucifixion. That was a, a popular method of, of, of execution then. And you're right. It was, at the time of Jesus, a popular method of execution. But here's the deal. At the time of the prophecy that was written in the book of Psalm, in Psalm chapter 22, which was translated into Hebrew, or from Hebrew into Greek, and we call it the Septuagint, and it was done 250 years before Jesus it, it existed, crucifixion didn't exist. It was instituted by the Romans hundreds of years later, long after this thing. This random prophecy, this seemingly obscure thing. I don't know why we're even writing this down. What do you mean he's going to be killed by being nailed to a tree with his hands and his feet pierced? That's crazy. It's not just that he was going to be, uh, be the seed of the woman and the lineage of Shem and the descendants of Abraham and the line of Isaac and the line of Jacob and the tribe of Judah and the family of Jesse and the house of David, a, that he was going to be killed by crucifixion. A, 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 a penalty or, a, or a, a, a mode of execution that didn't even exist yet. And then he would say something even more specific. Not just who he was going to be born for and how he was going to die, but the prophecies that were written thousands of years before Jesus, ending 500 years before Jesus, said that he was going to be the seed of the woman and the lineage of Shem and the descendants of Abraham and the line of Isaac and the line of Jacob and the tribe of Judah and the family of Jesse and the house of David, killed by crucifixion, but that he was going to be born in the city of Bethlehem. This random tiny little city and that all the circumstances would have to play out in a certain way in a certain time and certain kings would have to die at a certain point in a, in a, in a history so that all the circumstances so that Joseph and Mary would have to make their way to Bethlehem. Now you're thinking, hey, wait a minute. That's craziness. I mean, but what about I don't understand all this stuff. They, they were fulfilled over thousands of years. And then we come to a point where seven prophecies were fulfilled in one day. Seven prophecies about this guy who came from the seed of the woman and lineage of Shem and the descendants of Abraham and the line of Isaac and the line of Jacob and the tribe of Judah and the family of Jesse and the house of David, killed by crucifixion and born in Bethlehem, would come to a specific head all of a sudden where all these prophecies in one day that he would be betrayed. Not just that he would be betrayed, but that he would be betrayed by a friend. 
And not just that he would be betrayed and betrayed by a friend, but he would betray that friend for, seven, for, for 30 pieces of silver. Not 30 pieces of gold, not 30 coins of random value, not a specific, but 30 pieces of silver. And that those 30 pieces of silver would be, would be cast onto the floor, not on a table or not left for him in a dead drop somewhere, that they'd be thrown at his feet at the table. That 30 pieces of silver be thrown at his feet. And that, and that that would happen, not in the marketplace or in the street or in some back alley, but it would specifically happen in the temple. And that those 30 pieces of silver would be used to buy a potter's field. And that ultimately, the person of the Messiah, God's holy son, would, who stepped out of heaven to become a man for us, would put on skin and that he would die on a crucifixion. Seven days, seven prophecies, one day, all of it starting the seed of woman, the lineage of Shem, the descendants of Abraham, the line of Isaac, the line of Jacob, the tribe of Judah, and the family of Jesse and the house of David, the killed by crucifixion, born in Bethlehem, betrayed, betrayed by a friend, but for 30 pieces of silver thrown on the floor in the temple. And he would be, that those 30 pieces of silver would be used to buy a potter's field and that Jesus, the Messiah, would be crucified. Now, what is the rational explanation for all of that? What, what, what's, what's the evidence? You see the evidence? Now, what's the probability of that? A man named Peter Stoner, about 25 years ago, did the mathematical probability of God just, of Jesus or a person just fulfilling eight of these. We've done uh, 15, I think there are 17 of them total. But what if he just did these first eight? He multiplied out all the factors, figured out the populations, did all the things, and the time periods and all this stuff. And he said, here's the mathematical probability that one person would randomly, accidentally fulfill all eight of the prophecies. Not the 333, just the eight. What's the mathematical probability? Multiplied it out. You can still check this research. It's all documented in a book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict by Josh McDowell. And you can look at every single part of it. You'll find out really quickly that Peter Stoner's research, his academic research, demonstrated that the likelihood of meeting eight of those prophecies, not 333, just eight, would be the odds of one in 10 to the 17th power. Now, I'm not a mathematician. I'm, I can't even fathom, really, the, the, the length of 10 to the 17th power. I know a couple people who can, people who live in Vegas, people who live in Washington, D.C. Vegas, because they do the odds game all day, and, and in Washington, D.C., because they manage the national debt. <laughs> 10 to the 17th power. One in 10 to the 17th power. I can't even really fathom that. And so what Peter Stoner did is says, here's statistically what that would look like, is if we took silver dollars, and we laid silver dollars two feet deep, 100% covering the state of Texas. That's 10 to the 17th power. Like that, that if that we piled silver dollars two feet deep across the entire state of Texas, you know how long it takes to drive across Texas? And then we took one man in El, pa in El Paso, and after having mixed up all that stuff using bulldozers, we mixed up all those things and got them all back into the pile in the middle of Texas. This one man from El Paso, blindfolded, walked out into the middle, decided randomly to bend over and stick his hand down into the pile of silver dollars and pulled out the one that we marked with an X. I didn't say we were going to answer all of your objections. I just said that we were going to provide evidence that demands a verdict from you. Now we come down to why he said all that. Look at what the next verse says. He came into the world that he created. This is Jesus. The Messiah that was coming from the, you know, from the seed of the woman and lineage of Shem and the, and the descendants of Abraham and the, tri the line of, of Jesse and the line, all those things, right? He come to this point that he... Jesus came into the world that he created, but the world did not recognize him. He didn't see it. He, he says this, he came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed and accepted him, he gave the right to become the children of God. This is why it's so important. It's not just important that you have a place to be on Sunday. It's not even remotely important that you believe the way we believe. Can I just tell you this? You can believe whatever you believe and still belong here. We love you. But here's the best part. 
He says this, that we all rejected him. We've all been where you are at some point or another. But, and every single one of us have done it. But to all of us who believed him, he gave us the right to become the children of God. You know what's crazy about it is there was a, a, an atheist who set out to disprove the idea that God existed. His name was C.S. Lewis. And Charles Stives Lewis, right? C.S. Lewis set out to disprove the existence of God and he investigated it and he pushed and he pulled and he argued and he rationalized and understood and he worked hard and eventually came to give his life to Jesus because his conclusion was this, that the person of Jesus, after studying the person of Jesus, you only had really three options when it came to him. He was either liar, lunatic, or Lord? And that's really the question you have to answer. He said that it, this person of Jesus was either a liar to the degree that we have never seen anyone lie and orchestrate and manipulate and do all those things. He's either a complete liar or he's an absolute lunatic. He's just friggin' nuts. Or he's the Lord of heaven and earth. And he had to come to this place. He's like, look, I, I've seen the evidence. I don't think he was lying. I don't think he was crazy. His, his followers followed him all the way to their death. Every one of the disciples died by martyring their life. He said, I don't think he's a liar or a lunatic. I think the only rational explanation is he's the Lord of heaven and earth. It's the question, really, you have to figure out how to do. And so really, the evidence that we provided isn't evidence of everything, Right? It's just evidence that demands a verdict from you. And all I'm asking you to do is come to the same rationalization, the same understanding, the same rational place that Josh McDowell came to when he wrote evidence that demands a verdict. He set out to write a book disproving Christianity and came to give faith. It's the same question and the same answer that, that C.S. Lewis did when he said, listen, I came down to Jesus, either as liar, lunatic, or Lord. It's the, same, it's the same conclusion that all 12 disciples said when they gave their life to say, listen, he's clearly the Messiah. It's the same conclusion that many of us in this room and this family have come to. It's the same conclusion that the apostle Paul came to. Paul set out not just to disprove Christianity, he set out to kill followers of Jesus and eventually became one himself. And he said this. He said, therefore, God exalted him, Jesus, to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess and in heaven on earth and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. So here's what I just ask of you. Would you just join with all those cloud of great witnesses, those folks who've investigated and argued, those folks who have the same argument that you're hearing today, and just respond with this. It's the only logical response in my mind. All hail King Jesus. He came from the seed of the woman and the lineage of Shem and the descendants of Abraham and the, the line of Isaac and the line of Jacob and the tribe of Judah and the family of Jesse and the house of David and he was killed by crucifixion and born in Bethlehem and he was betrayed by a friend in the, in the temple by throwing the money on the floor. The money was used to buy a potter's field and he stretched out his arms and died so that you could have life. Wow. It's evidence that demands a verdict. What are you going to do? I say we all hail King Jesus. <laughs> that's my response. And if that's where you're at today, you're like, hey, I want to do that. I want you to consider doing this. Would you do this? You don't have to walk an aisle. You don't got to do anything special. But here's the deal. Would you do this? Go to ourjourney.news. Click on that next steps button. If you're here in the room with us, you can scan that QR code on the back of it and just click on the bottom. It says, I want to begin a relationship with Jesus. I want to talk about this, right? You're not committing to anything. You're not buying something. You're not signing a contract. I just want to have a conversation with you. Or maybe when you walk out of this room today, you can just, just peck me on the shoulder. You know what I look like now? Just say, hey, can we talk a minute? I want to talk about following Jesus. I, I, I just have questions. I want to have answers. I don't know if I have them all, but I can point you to a guy who does. All hail. Put you
on the cross it continues on he lives forever and ever but I want you to not miss this part right here we're gonna continue this story 